tends to require a certain degree of duplication of work uh, at each parallel stage. Uh, oftentimes you have to send at least some of the data and often give a copy of that to all of the subtasks of the parallel tasks that you're running, uh, which you're storing someplace and which is taking up uh, some of the number of electrons. Uh, and so that you, it could be argued at least <coughs> that the more parallel your code becomes, the less energy efficient it becomes. So actually, I would, I would actually argue the opposite. <coughs> and the reason why is because I would say um, much of the energy that's generated in a lot of these traditional systems is because of, is purely is, is entirely because the, the the power cost of moving this data around in the system because the wires are frankly just too long, and the movement towards the, the the computational throughput of packing together data so you can get the computational density is actually also completely correlated with the power efficient program. So it is a, it's a very interesting question, but I, it, to me, it's maybe in a happy coincidence actually ending up in the same place. You actually need to be able to think <coughs> of this high density, low level um, uh, parallelism. My opinion. So I think I'm, it's interesting hearing both of those concepts. I, I think I probably agree with Chris, actually, right? because he, you make a point. As you do more parallelism, you are always going to throw away some energy because you have to do the same thing again. That's a very frequent parallel programming construct. So you can imagine that there must exist a Pareto curve where if I do it in serial, it takes me forever, but I can do it in a minimal energy budget. I can absolutely compute what my energy budget to get me my answer is. And as I throw parallelism at it, maybe I don't decrease my energy budget very much until, but imagine in the crazy situation where I throw 100 billion threads at it, maybe my energy budget goes up significantly. I'm not entirely sure that I'm happy that MATLAB is going to be run against its energy budget. You know, what is, <laughs> what, what, how much energy did you take to compute this answer? Yeah. It's going to be answers per erg, or, you know, or whatever, or obviously dual, but uh, showing the uh, possible other units. Yes, I, that would be an interesting thing to do, and a distressing thing, I suspect, for programmers. <laughs> But maybe we should do it. Maybe we oh, should be. Uh, maybe maybe you should have your LU factorization, your HPC lim pack against how much energy did you spend. It'll uh, it will cause people to do different optimizations, and I think it will cause people to at least recognise that they are paying energy to get their answer more quickly. And I think if they understood that trade-off better, then they would at least know what they're doing. I think that's the only thing. I think we can only give them the information and let them make the decision. So we're going to see a toolbox for energy profiling? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone want to put that on the list? Yes. <laughs> Someone will make an app for that, actually. <laughs> well, well there, there is another driving factor, though, which on the energy front, which is um, these machines are getting very, very expensive to run, independent yeah. of the software. So it's, it's nothing, you know, you hear about the machines in the top 500. These oh. machines are spending easily five to twenty million dollars a year in power bills. How many academic institutions are willing to put that money up? And so what they're saying is we're not. We'll go in we'll go in something modest and you'll make the best use of it possible. And if you need more then you're gonna have to go outside. You're gonna have to go to the cloud and you're gonna have to have your own money to do it. I mean could somebody go out and say, for the last year, this machine took twenty megawatts for the whole year or whatever. How much computer? How much real computation? How many That's real right. answers did it generate? I mean, is that not a study that we could? Uh, yeah. No one will want to do it because <laughs> <laughs> they'll find out it's a major ripoff. <laughs> but you're right; it's exactly right. I've, I've actually, for a long time, saying, been saying that they ought to take a look at the top 500 and, uh, on a um, price performance metric, and, and I mean all the costs associated with running a machine that big, and see then and do exactly what you suggest, and maybe those machines won't be so quite as quite so attractive anymore. Interesting. It's not, again, I, you know, I think there's the top 500 list is an interesting way to measure things. It's important to see where we're going and where we've been. I'm not trying to, to, to you know, to diss it in any way, but I, I do think um, back, back to reality, you have to think about what, what do I really need and what, what's the best way to get my job done and, and the people that are gonna do that in the most cost effective way are the ones that will be successful. So of course we should put a plea in at this point to the uh, the 
hardware generators to tell us how much energy is being used so that we can then tell people for this LU factorization, this is how much energy we used. How, how much energy is going to be used in calculating the amount of energy that's being used? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that's factored in. <laughs> so just picking up on uh, Dave's mention of the top 500, um, let me ask you, what do you think the international HPC scene is going to be in five years' time? I think it's unquestionably going to be much more international, I think, than it traditionally has been. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, partially it's driven by there's actually a huge number of development resources that are almost arguably increasingly moving outside <coughs> the traditional centers of, uh, where the development is being, ha has traditionally been done. Um, so it, it will be really interesting to see how that, how that evolves over time. Um, I think that one of the things that is interesting to me is this concept that I heard heard it called a computenik, um, <laughs> and and in China is our computenik now, and they've taken everything they can learn from us and they've built machines and gotten them to the top of the list, and it won't be long before they stop and they start building their own their own ships that'll will do better than what we can do today, and so before when you'd come to this show early in the 80s or the 90s early 90s and you'd have this, you know, vendors from from um, from this country, all having their own architectures. Maybe what'll happen is we'll have an architecture race between countries, and um, that might actually really drive this fundamental building block change that we're talking about. So I think in the next five years, you're going to see more and more specialized hardware like the GPUs um, and, and things like that, um, because it's going to be the only way to to move to to, to get performance gains. You're not going to be able to just Add 100,000 or 200 or 300,000 cores because the meantime between failure won't let you get anything done. You're, you're, you're going to certainly lose uh, your, your, your apps, won't be able to run long enough without a failure of some sort along the way, whether it be networking or otherwise. And so um, it, it could be very, very interesting. It could also be very, very scary for many of the, many of the countries that are competing. Yeah, I mean, certainly over the last five years, we have seen a significant growth in the number of Asian um, supercomputers coming in. And certainly if you look at the top 500, they are radically growing. If you read the papers and look at what's happening in Europe, you uh, don't imagine that that's going to grow very fast at the moment, unfortunately. Um, and so I think that there'll be a, a relatively strong move towards Asia is certainly what one would look and predict at the moment. One interesting data point we I picked up was at the uh, Asian conference uh, that preceded ISC this year. And there they had uh, uh, countries from uh, pretty much the, the five tigers, uh, Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, uh, among others. And uh, I thought they were more interesting than the Chinese and the Japanese. And that these small countries that pretty much made their, their money from manufacturing said in order to compete in global economy, we have to go to uh, uh, supercomputing. And it's become a national priority that we have internal uh, high performance computing capabilities. Uh, I think the, uh, you know, the Chinese is, is essentially what we would call a, a state capitalism system, and which has the advantage of when, when they decide to move in one direction, they can do it with a great deal of force. And they seem to have decided to go to uh, probably should not be uh, forgotten about. They certainly have the capability to do that. I think the other country that might be interested in watching is Brazil, uh, because they also have a lot of interest in that area and have more of an industrial base than most people think about. Mm. Okay, well let me ask you then, um, in those same five years, what do you anticipate is going to be um, the major change in our industry. Where do you see uh, advances <coughs> that we're going to make in the next five years? Is the GPU going to become the dominant accelerator? I, get, I mean, our, our the, the long range perspective, I think, I mean, five years or even beyond five years. Um, I guess I, all I can do is present my opinion, I guess. Um, certainly something like the GPU, it seems like it is 
absolutely, absolutely the right path to go down. The, uh, somebody mentioned earlier on the panel that um, the, 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 the golden days of basically sitting on your butt and getting the volume processes to get faster and faster for the last quarter century are, are clearly over. Um, so I think the GVP is the right path. Um, our perspective is that, from speaking for maybe for NVIDIA, it's certainly my opinion, <laughs> um, being able to start with a device that, that's, that's sort of the beginning of the path that you're going to evolve to to provide the type of architecture that's going to deliver exascale computing, it's going to be something that looks very much like a GPU. And uh, the investments that we make now in, on the architecture side um, need to be coupled together with uh, the collaborations that we talked about earlier in the, in the community to make sure that we all kind of move forward together so we don't do, you know, so we won't be at the risk of outstripping the, 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 the human resources that are going to be able to exploit the, the hardware as it moves forward. Hey, I think, I think that's, I think it's inevitable that, that, like you said, but I think the thing that worries me is the compilers historically have not kept pace. And until they do, we're not going to reap the full benefit of those hardware improvements. And it goes back to what Anne was asking earlier, should we be investing more in software development? And compilers are certainly part of that. Um, it's, it's a real hard problem. And I don't, you know, I, I don't see, it's not a sexy problem. So you don't see the funding agencies throwing money at it like they are, you know, build me the biggest, fastest computer in the world. So it, it's a real worry. So going back to what I said earlier about, you know, yes, we've had single, and as Jerry said, we had single uh, CPUs that were running one core, they had access memory. That's gone up to multiple cores accessing memory. We've now gone to GPUs accessing memory. <clears throat> the obvious thing that's going to start to happen <coughs> is that things that I program, not massive supercomputers, but the supercomputers in industry, are going to have to deal with NUMA. So the, the next evolution is that you've got cores, but they have a non-uniform memory architecture. And we're already having enough problems programming just multiple core machines and GPUs. As soon as you add NUMA into that, that's going to become distinctly harder. I think the other thing that is obvious that's going to happen is that SIMD, exposed in whatever form, either on a GPU or in processors or in AVX or any of these things, is obviously something that's going to have to evolve. We're obviously, therefore, going to have to program to the SIMD model, which means that we're going to have to reduce our branch uh, branching across codes, we need to make sure that threads do the same thing. Therefore, from all of that, it looks as though necessarily we have to assume that there will be lots and lots of threads. They may have different access to memory, they may have numer access and things like that, so therefore we have to change our programs. I hope you're all feeling scared at this point, because I am. <laughs> um, but yes, that fundamentally, I think, lots and lots of threads, probably SIMD in many of them, almost certainly with non-uniform memory architectures, is what we're going to have to do for the next five years. Now, what high-level HPC looks like, well, kind of it already looks a little bit like that. <laughs> so hopefully they will give us some clues, but I think they're going to have problems as well. It's a, it's a great comment. I think um, just looking at some of the optimization work we've done recently to, to leverage some of the new hardware, especially the SIMD stuff, um, it's, it's counter to what you learn in computer science. <laughs> It's, it's counter to what we've been doing the last 20 years in object-oriented programming and, and, and good data structures. What you really want to do is go back, throw back all the way to the Cray XMP and get the longest vectors at perfect vector stride and get all your logic gates out. And it's, it's, it's like a real twist in, in thinking. And, and, and yeah, I don't see it changing. I think we're going to have to go back. Yeah, for those of us who are thinking machines, we're reliving a lot of uh, old times. Yeah. Uh, first off, I think we're going to see uh, accelerators become a standard part of uh, computer systems, mainly because there isn't any reason not to do that. Uh, I, this may be wishful thinking, but I think we may be at a point in, in history where uh, the market may be ripe for actually doing some new and innovative work in computer architectures, uh, particularly around memory systems, uh, particularly around uh, systems that can help uh, uh, process interprocess communications and I'm sort of looking forward to seeing what uh, what the engineers are going to come up with in the next five years okay we 
uh, we'll be wrapping up shortly, but I'd like to offer the opportunity to people around the uh, table. If anybody has a question that they would like to pose <coughs> to our panel, now is your opportunity.